Hey, Scott, how's it going? Good, P. How are you doing? You look fantastic. Oh, I'm, thank you. You're too kind. You're, uh, I mean, our audience here is is in for a treat. I imagine that's probably like your your earnings call outfit as as well. <laughs> uh, you look fantastic. I prefer the hoodie, but but it had to show up for the crew. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, um, everyone, I'm super pumped to have Scott here today. He's for folks who are not familiar, he's the chief business officer at Zoom Info. Probably a couple of you have heard of Zoom Info before, um, but uh, but but Scott looks after the operations and how the like the the machine operates at Zoom Info. And Zoom Info, in addition to being a, like a pretty august uh, sales technology provider, you know they're pretty pretty non-shabby uh, sales organization themselves. So I'm really excited to hear, um, to talk with Scott about about those things. Um, but but thank you everyone for joining us in one of our uh, sessions here for Camp Modern Sales. Um, obviously we have a lot of, uh, of you know, high profile VIP worthies out there, but uh, Scott definitely at the top of the pack there. Um, just for, by way of introductions, um, introduce myself really quickly. My name is Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders of Atrium. Atrium makes data-driven sales management software that helps sales organizations improve the performance of their reps through the better application of data. Um, and uh, prior to Atrium, I started a recruiting software company called Talentbin that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014. And that's kind of where I went from being a, a business generalist founder to a first sales rep and then a sales leader and then you know, off, off, into the, off to the races. Um, but enough about me. Um, Scott, maybe you can kind of give folks a little bit of a rundown of what you spend your time doing at Zoom Info and then maybe... Um, you know, the kind of the roles, although you've been at Zoom Info and before that Discover or before the merger um, for, for a hot second here. So maybe you can kind of share with folks a little bit about what you spend your time doing there and, and kind of like your background before that. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Super excited to be a part of this and, uh, and support you in the community. Um, so a little bit of a non-traditional SaaS background. I came out of automotive. I worked for Daimler for about a decade, um, building cars wow. and trucks. And then uh, got the opportunity, wanted to pivot into to SaaS and um, go a little bit smaller. So um, found Henry and the team at Discover.org who were doing big things and jumped in to help them acquire Zoom Info. And since then, I've been kind of a utility player going from role to role, helping the company grow, um, improve processes, um, led the SCR team for a minute, led operations, um, went through a, a gig as the CMO for a while and now landed in the, the most recent role. So I've got operations, um, all the technology that runs the business. So SAP, Workday, ServiceNow, Salesforce, and oh, then wow. lead our PMO org, um, doing kind of major program work. So keeps keeps it really interesting and able to go affect change and help drive the business. And uh, yeah, it's been fun to, to learn and grow with this really smart group of people. Yeah, how um, that is that is that that's fantastic. Um, you know, the the funny thing is, is that like I, I a lot of people don't know this, but I came to or like how I started to understand data driven sales management was really because um, my my dad's a mechanical engineer, and he had me read this book um, when I was eighteen <laughs> called The Goal, and um, the goal is um, it's a fantastic book. It's uh, a narrative parable, um, but it's um, manufacturing. It's like you know operations research, manufacturing optimization book, written as a novel, obviously, right? In order to keep it you know keep it spicy, and I read that when I was eighteen, and you know I read it a couple times since then and what have you. But when I first started. Um, you know, selling at Talent Bin in um, 2011 or so, and had a couple reps. I started kind of seeing like how it rhymed. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, this is like, this is kind of like a factory. We've got the SDRs, and then they they put a meeting on the AEs, and the AEs have a certain amount of meeting and like ops that they can carry at any given point in time. I'm like, oh, this feels like 
you know, this feels like that. And like, oh, there's a constraint here. You know, there's Herbie, et cetera. And, and then you're literally from a manufacturing background. So, uh, I mean, like, so when I found that out, I was like, oh, well, that makes a ton of sense. No wonder the Zoom Info sales organization is just like chugga, 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 chugga. So, you know, maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about, you know, how you think of sales organizations and how it like as relates to operational rigor and constraints and you know revenue factories and what have you maybe at, at Zoom Info and kind of like you know how your background kind of like tied to that. Um, awesome, yeah. The goal is an amazing book. Uh, I, I actually majored in supply chain and it was required reading. And uh, and if you haven't read it, there's now a new book, The Phoenix Project, which is kind of a DevOps uh, digital technology adaptation of the goal, uh, an mm -hmm. homage back by Gene Kim um, out of Portland here actually. And it kind of applies those same lessons to the, the tech world. But I yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I often joke that, you know, I, I don't have certain particular hard skills or, or technological. I didn't come from a coding background. I didn't come from a sales background. And the things that I can do are take a look at processes and help understand and mobilize people to make those processes better. And kind of came from the Toyota production system and, and the, the goal and theory of constraints. But I think when you, when you step back and you look at it, there have been people trying to unpack manufacturing processes for, you know, hundreds of years, decades, and putting a lot of significant thought into it. And they came across wow. these insights. And so it was an aha moment for me when I came in and I'd say, you know, we're trying to balance the funnel all the way through. And we're seeing this bottleneck in the process. We're seeing, uh, we have, more leads than SDRs, or we have too much capacity here or there. And then you start to think about concepts. There's a concept called line balancing, which across your supply chain and your and your production line, everything should have equal capacity. And anywhere where you right. have low, low capacity is going to be a naturally limiting factor. And so it's like, oh, right. if I then go and design my revenue process, um, more leads actually doesn't mean necessarily in and of itself more revenue. And I think everyone has this uh, view that, oh, let's just double this input and we're going to double the output. And that's not really how right. it works. Um, and so that leads you to partner better, to design better processes. If I can work with the CMO and create a fully balanced plan of you drive this right. many leads, SDR team, you, you, know, you have this many uh, SDRs to drive capacity, it flows through. And one of the insights going from whatever you know, 400 people as a company to for, you know, nearly 4,000 is we're a lot <laughs> more aware of those mechanics and right. hey, we'll need to hire this many AEs to offset this, you know, this spike in demand. I, I equated even to like biology. If you were to double the vegetation yeah. in a forest, then all of the deer population doubles, the wolves double, but then they eat all the deer and the whole ecosystem collapses. It's a, it's a very yeah. systemic type of relationship. And so the more you can understand those systems, uh, the better. So, yeah, I, this was something that was like, like we, um, we saw this quite a bit of talent and this actually like influenced the, the creation of Atrium was I got pretty good at Salesforce reporting. I got pretty good at like, you know, hacking things together and um, just the notion of instrumenting both the quantity, but then also the quality of selling behavior all throughout the funnel became really important because like as an example on the lead um gen point if you just like double the amount of leads you'll just end up with a pile of leads in front of people right yeah. not being worked and uh, as we know from the goal inventory is not our friend right like it's essentially money that we then you know pay to google adwords or linkedin or maybe sdr salary expense or whatever and then they created these little ops that are then sitting there in ae pipelines not being touched or being touched infrequently or what have you and so then um like those you maybe heard some metrics that i was talking about there like untouched opportunities that's a quality metric that would indicate to us that somebody is potentially overloaded right? Or, you know, or time between touches, right? And so this was something that like really influenced the, the way that we think about measuring and managing and improving the performance of, of individual reps and like much more broadly teams was just this notion of having like instrumentation probes in 
the the entire factory but and not at a factory level too because the the, the thing the thing that and i'm sure that i would love actually your take on this the funny thing about factories or like you know just like manufacturing processes or what have you is like the, it's like machines acting on like like widgets or what have you and there's not like and it's kind of deterministic not 100 percent, but it's like fairly deterministic whereas the things like our factories that we deal with it's like the machines are people right <laughs> like salespeople, and and like the the reason why they're like the reason why we have salespeople is because they're very persuasive and they're they're able to like you know extract information and like reason and what have you but they're also not like you know five nines reliable with respect to managing their pipeline and and what have you which is why you need to instrument at the rep level and not just at an organizational level because like, you know, each rep is essentially an assembly line. And, um, you know, I struggle with this because sometimes I'm just like, can't you just like act like a machine? It's like, no, I can't because like if I just acted like a machine, I wouldn't be this like persuasive human or what have you. How do you kind of like balance that? We're like, well, essentially what we've got, is, especially in you guys' case, we've got like an army of sellers and like an army of SDRs. That's a huge assembly line of, of sellers. And we want to instrument them, but at the same time, they're human, right? So they can't be within like 99.9% .9 tolerances. How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think um, that has been one of the biggest learnings for us is the human component of designing processes and also the focus on revenue enablement and, um, and, and kind of this importance of frontline leadership and, and their ability to coach, mentor, and manage to metrics. Um, I think in sales, a lot of times we talk about the number one rep, the, the all-star closed 10 times quota, just this amazing individual and everyone wants to copy. And I think that's, that's great. And we should celebrate that individual. Uh, but when I look at how do I drive the best outcome for every individual in the sales team and the company, it's how do I create a process that all of my reps can be successful at? which exactly. is not no often, heroes. yeah, it's not often the same process that's driving Joe to drive 10 X of quota. And, yeah. uh, and so I think you hit on it, which is how do we design processes that are, um, combining data and humans to leverage their creativity, what they're good at, their particular skills while taking things off their plate, um, that aren't as value add, uh, managing yep. the, the metrics and, being able to see who's struggling and not where we need to lean and put focus. And I think from an enablement standpoint, we actually were doing too much um, and needed to pull back. There's, a, there's an amount of men, you know, uh, learning capacity and an ability to try new things effectively. And we were, we were throwing the kitchen sink at folks and mm. they would have a cursory knowledge, but not mastery over any of these topics we were putting in front of them. So I think now I try to limit the change. I try to, you know, create a repetitive process that builds excellent reps. And one of the biggest things is growing SDRs into senior SDRs, growing them into AEs, growing them into then uh, top AEs, growing them into sales leaders. We promote significantly from within. We have an entire kind of bench program that grows folks in a way that um, they have those skills by the time they arrive at the different roles and stages. Yeah, I like the, um, the notion of like a process that is reliable and you don't need like you don't need heroes right like something that can work for the army and doesn't necessarily work doesn't have to require green berets um as you were talking about the the quote that popped to mind was um uh, amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics right where it's like hey man like that's cool. We can talk about like, you know, being in the deal. Oh, you should have thought about this and this deal right here. It's like, Hey man, can we have a sales process that is like, you know, impermeable to like, you know, to rep because like reps are going to make errors. Mm -hmm. Just It is like the, the name of the game. Right. And so can we systematize things such that we have a high level of reliability across a hundred reps, 200 reps, it's et cetera, et cetera. Because like, that's the key um that's going to be the key to to success um to success there the um the other thing i was going to um ask you about was um you know i know that there's lots of different processes that you guys have optimized over the years at, at zoom info but one of the things that i think that you guys are really well known for that i would love you know maybe for you to share with folks is the speed to lead process 
Um, I think actually Henry shared, it was probably like a little bit more than a year ago at, a, at one of our virtual summits, but like the speed to lead process. But it, what's crazy about it is like, there's a speed to lead process that like already is like super fast, but then there's also like a prioritization and routing component predicated on like win rate and what have you. Maybe you can like share that a little bit with folks because it's like, it's kind of like a modern marvel of, of sales operations. Yeah, uh, I'd tell you a funny story on that one. When I first started, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of context for what a great response time was, and especially by Discover Org or Zoom Info's definition. And I, I was in a meeting, and now our president, uh, Chris Hayes, came in with, with Henry as our CEO and said, Henry just filled out a form on the website, and he didn't get a call back for 15 minutes. And I was like, wow, these guys are really on it. 15 minutes is quick to call these guys back. And our head of inbound at the time goes, I'm sorry, that'll never happen again. <laughs> and I'm going, <laughs> oh, this place is wired different. And then I, you know, after the fact, I'm like, hey, you know, what's our SLA? What's this about? And he's like, we call everyone back in 90 seconds. And I was like, 90, that's, that's wild. That's insane. And so unpacking it, you know, I kind of, worked with that team to understand and and like just from a basic human principles perspective when i'm on your website and i'm engaging with your site and i fill in my name i take all that time to peruse your website and take enough initiative to go in and say like i want to learn more in that moment is is the peak of my curiosity it is i'm st you're still top of mind uh, you're not in a meeting, you're not doing other things. And what, when we looked at the, the response time, even waiting that five, 10 minutes, it's a third, a half of the conversion rate to demo for the SDRs. Yeah. And so we made it a priority on our leads, uh, especially the best ones to call back. So, um, when, when everything comes in, uh, we're able to get it into Salesforce, um, now, and this has been a, been a process of a lot of failing and learning and trying and, different algorithms and, and scoring methodologies, but we have kind of a hybrid machine learning score and then a, a different score. The, they come in, they get dropped in, and we have a whole engine routing to folks. And so they actually have a notification that pops up on their machine the moment a lead comes in, and then it, it pulls them out of the queue when they're working that lead and, and everything gets round robin to a whole crew. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a journey going through that. And I would, I would encourage people, you know, we didn't arrive at 90 seconds and, you know, 70% conversion on those leads in a day. We started out and we were converting 10% of leads and calling back in 15, 20 minutes. And we said, right. okay, if you look at 90 seconds, it's not achievable in, in your head, you know, at the moment. So yeah. let's get it to 10 minutes. What do we have to do? What's the next step in the exactly. journey? I think that applies to almost all sales processes. It's, we can totally. have this aspirational goal. And I, I love what you said about the, you know, amateurs talking strategy and whatever winners talking execution. I think it even a 80% right strategy executed really well will always win. And so to me, yeah. if I can get us closer, but not perfect, every step um, gets us a little bit closer to that. So I would encourage people just to try and make it better and get closer and closer. You'll see the results play out in your funnel. Um, yes. It, it's not, not to, not, not to belabor the goal, but it's a continuous improvement, continuous yeah. improvement. Cause like, that's what we're just doing is we're just like looking, if you, if you compartmentalize all the different steps of whatever the process is, right. In this case, you might say the step, the process here is from a form, like a form being filled or like someone getting on, someone being on the website and the form being filled to a meeting being on the calendar. If, if we try to think about like, you know, someone seeing an ad on Google or on LinkedIn or all the way to a closed deal, that's like so big. So like, let's get into here, right? And then think about like, what are the different steps are right there? So we get more of those meetings on the calendar. And then, and then now it's like way more manageable and we can say, great, um, let's focus on getting, like calling this person back instead of every 15 minutes, go to 10 minutes. Okay, we've achieved that. Maybe now we can get it to five minutes or what have you. Similarly, and then that's like this part of the process right here. Someone's responsible for that. Now it could be someone over here who could say, hey, you know what? We just want to make sure we want to raise our conversion rate from disco to, you know, POC, whatever, 
right? Like, okay, cool. Like we have some, you know, sales assist motion, like zoom info. I would imagine it's like, Hey, you guys want to see some of our sick data? Let's go ahead and like do some sort of, like, let's just, if we just raise our conversion rate instead of getting like 20% of those folks out of disco into that, maybe we just get 25%. I'm not even asking for 30. I'm just asking for 25 and then think, and then like put that bug in everybody's ear to then be driving to that next step. Lo and behold, then it becomes part of the muscle and then then you move on to the next one right now of course what we want to make sure that we do is we codify the thing that we just learned like okay cool we're not going to like back we're going to move on to something else we're going to backslide back from 10 minutes to 15 minutes you just systematize it but in these in this approach you can then you can isolate these issues and then honey badger them right whether it's organization wide or the thing that we work we talk with our customers a lot about is like figure out what the constraint is on the rep level right mm-hmm. on the human and then honey badger that right like hey bobby you've got a big untouched opportunity problem hey susie you have a customer facing meeting problem they're different for those two but we're going to honey badger that and then once that's retired we're going to go to the next one and like that way it can be a lot easier for people to like you know rather than trying to boil the ocean you compartmentalize a problem and then you can fix that specific problem versus just kind of being like a wash and like, oh man, this is like such an inter- insurmountable thing, right? So I, I think it's actually an interesting question because you were talking about like you got your program management team and what have you. At this point, you guys have like, you know, a thousand plus person sales organization. How do you select the thing that like is going to be honey badgered next, right? Like going to be compartmentalized and, and kind of t- and, you know, get your attention and get your team's attention. Yeah, I think um, that, that honestly is one of my biggest priorities as we scale as an org is how do we really set a, a high level strategy? And then within that, we make really good prioritization decisions uh, within yeah. the RevOps team. And so all of our org is using a consistent framework to pull in all of the various improvement suggestions. So we lean a lot and have really great uh, relationships with our internal stakeholders. So if it's CX, mm or the sales org, they're coming with, we'd like to improve the router to do this, like our off hours or international coverage. We'd like to have more rep availability or better cascade logic of meetings booked after 8 p.m. Uh, And so we'll bring all of those in and then crash them against our kind of top priorities. For us, you know, we want to grow our enterprise business and and continue to Mm -hmm. mature our sales organization. We want to deliver amazing customer experience. If it doesn't fall into those major buckets, we really do kind of a tough look and say, should we be spending time on that? And then I think for, it doesn't need to be complicated, but you have to have a list. You have to determine what is the impact. And there's a few ways to get to that. If you can get it to ACV or whatever your metric is revenue, um, that's amazing. But even if it's just how many people or uh, how many things are impacted by this process and how much can we improve it? It's a very good proxy for, um, the benefit and then look against the effort. And um, all of my prioritization is effort versus impact and basically kind of a combined output of what's the best thing to work on, making sure it aligns the the core priorities of the organization. And I, it maybe sounds complicated. It's It doesn't need to be. And I think even if well, you're a very I- small organization, create a spreadsheet, go through it, align with your other leaders. The, the most important thing is actually less what you do. It's that you all do it together. And yeah, I, I think that's a good point, right? Like, yeah, you followed all the way through. You were saying, no, I just, I, I said, I've, uh, we have had moments in our journey where we've had amazingly smart people with amazing, great ideas. And the reality is that, and especially with a, a younger, less resourced organization, you will have to say no to good ideas in yes. lieu of better ideas or more relevant time sensitive ideas. And again, you have to focus on as an entire org, how do we, how do our product initiatives line up to our marketing initiatives, line up to what we're doing in the sales org and that ever, you know, whatever product is being pushed, whatever features being pushed, marketing is supporting and the sales guys can go put it to market and the customers actually want it and find value in it. And it sounds easy, but it's way harder, um, well, yeah, because you're aligning like a core. ton, a ton, a ton of like humans and uh, like I'm a big uh, Jason Lemkin fan um, and 
you know, I think that he talks about this as relates to, he talked about it as relates to like um, startups getting acquired by a larger organization as it becomes mm -hmm. less about like, you know, specific innovation. It becomes more about like a lot, like specific innovation and, and like bias to action. It becomes more about like alignment. And, um, but I think that the same thing applies as like a small organization becomes like a medium organization because a large organization, right? Um, the, uh, it's, it becomes more about alignment. Right. And like, you know, just making sure that like all everybody is like rowing in the same direction. Um, and what that means is, and I think a lot of times people struggle with this and say, hey, you know what, we should really fix this thing right here. And it's like, you know what, I think what you're saying is like, this is a problem. And I agree with you. You are right. Right. But we got a lot of problems. <laughs> right. And like, that's not because like you're not perceptive. Like, that is, you are right. But what we need is a framework by which to say, hey, what is the economic impact of that problem? And like, what is the perceived cost associated with solving that? And part of the perceived cost associated with solving that might not be monetary costs. It might be the fact that Scott only has. I'm thinking about it in a small organization, think about a sales org, like, hey, I only got one sales ops manager, right? Or I got two, right? And so if, if he or she is working on that, they're not working on this over here. So really what we're just doing is we're just load balancing, right? We're just load balancing our lines, right? And making sure that those, those folks have like, they have enough on their plate that they can do and execute at a high level of quality. In this ha case, it happens to be programs versus ops, right? For like, you know, AEs have like, oh, cool, you've got 50 ops in your pipe. No wonder your untouched op, you know, are like going bananas. Oh, cool, uh, Mr. Sales Operations Manager, you've got eight projects that you're working on. No wonder nothing's getting done and everything's like done in a half, you know, half baked fashion. And so just making sure that you're like, you can do that with a single sales operations person, right? Say, Hey, you know what? Let's prioritize, like, sorry, let's list out all the things that we want here and, and, and say, like, Hey, how common is that? And how hard is it going to be to, at this point, like, I mean, how many people are in the, in the, uh, in the operations and, uh, you know, in the, or sorry, the PMO org for you guys, you're probably still resource constrained even after the point that you have like dozens and dozens fo uh, of folks to like work on stuff and make things better, right? Yeah, the um, yeah, the PMOs, uh, maybe 12 to 15 doing major programs and then the operations team who's managing all of the kind of core sales processes, maybe 20 plus um, folks. But yeah, there's a, a real high degree of coordination that has to happen there. It, it, you know, it reminded me of, um, it, and I guess a piece of career advice, because my wiring was, I'm just going to maniacally run through as many things to get done as I can. And I'm going to demonstrate brute force that I'm a doer. And, and there's value in that. And I think people find, oh, th those people, you know, they're great. They have insane work ethic and they, they work really hard. And what I eventually found was, the thing that was, you know, whole, one of the things that was holding me back was people didn't feel like um, I was aware of, of certain problems or I wasn't getting to certain things or there was no feedback loop on why certain things were getting worked in others. And, you know, Henry and I had a discussion. And I remember him saying to me specifically, like, you need to create a framework and a mechanism to explain to people where you're going to spend your time to accomplish what but then also be able to have really clear and crisp feedback loops on why we're saying no to things and make sure you're communicating to them. And, and again, it might not yeah. sound super complicated, but I think being able to communicate why we're doing certain things, why we're not, and having clear channels of communication of saying, you know, Pete, we've had this discussion about the third iteration of lead routing. We need to fix the customer journey motion. And we all know that driving customer experience is our number one thing right now. And so it, 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 our relationship gets stronger because you don't feel like I'm, you feel heard and there's, there's right. valid. Hey there's, Pete, we're not doing your thing because I think you stink. Right. Yeah. It's, no, it's just, know. it's <laughs> otherwise it's, Hey, why is Scott ignoring me? Why does he always deprioritize me? Like I can't get any of his time to get this thing done. Um, but I am acting on in what I view as the best interest of the organization without that communication, without that shared framework to talk about why we're doing certain things. 
uh, it's really hard to get by it. And the M&A example is perfect too. The more that you have a codified strategy, a codified way, like zoom in for the acquisition strategy was clear. We have an amazing customer base, a, an amazing yeah. core product that serves sellers. We want to build adjacent solutions that help those sellers drive value with data to sell more and leverage the customer base we had to grow our business. And that was really easy to articulate to all of the acquired companies. And one of the first things we did was bring them into our go-to-market strategy and frameworks, adapt them into our model and paint a very clear product roadmap and vision of how the things fit together. And so I, I think just some simple alignment and, and strategy can go a whole long way in making sure that the org is all operating in the same way. Yeah. And so we're, I know we're talking about alignment as it relates to like driving, you know, high, high efficiency sales organizations or what have you. I think um, it's funny. There's like a, like alignment as a concept and, and like, you know, uh, high, high, high throughput, low friction workflows is kind of the theme here. I think one of the things that, um, that Zoom Info has been popularizing recently is notion of like doing that at the rep level or at the SDR level with con these concepts of like smart plays, right? So essentially like aligning your efforts such that you're not like, you know, having a bunch of like plates that are spinning and like one of them falls over or what have you, but instead, you know, something happens in an account, you know, some contact makes a move, something happens in an op, et cetera, et cetera. And then being able to act on it as quickly as possible either to get the meeting set if you're an SDR or to, you know, to, to drive engagement if you're an AE or what have you. Um, I know that this is something that you guys have been talking quite a bit about. Maybe you can share a little bit about that um, here and how you guys like a, how the technology works and how you guys like use your own, your own gear to, to do that. And then also like, you know, some examples of, of what that looks like in practice. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think, um, you know, when we looked, at the first sales solutions that came out and you know we came out companies like outreach and others and there were these disconnected solutions that were all trying to accomplish a piece of the overall puzzle and there was we need really amazing foundational data to understand what's happening and then we need kind of this great intent engine to understand how that's moving and shifting and then we need ways to activate that data and do something with it. And so I think where we're, everything is converging and we're, what we're really driving is this concept of, of plays where we're coming and we're using really great data. We're using a logical rule set and engine. And then, um, you know, we're having really great activation of that through uh, email cadences, through, through calling, through next best action um, for the reps. And so when I think about it, we, you know, we were the guinea pigs largely internally. I built out a team called RevGen, um, and it was kind of a marketing team within ops um, that supported sales. And their only mission is sending out emails and cadences and, and running plays in reps' names, whether it's an SDR or an AE. <laughs> and so it. we ran hundreds of plays. Um, so every meeting that you take, uh, when the meeting is over, you're automatically loaded into a sequence based on your persona, the product that we talked about, um, and then the type of business you are. And we had bespoke cadences that would keep you engaged. And so we, you know, we talk about a rep, they have really great intentions and they try to do as much as they can, but sometimes they don't follow up. This just is a steady stream of communication, adding value, giving additional context to the, you know, the, the prospect and, and helping move things along. And so we're doing that all along. And so when you think about the entire buyer journey, whether it's hooking them with really great copy and really relevant messaging from an SDR, uh, whether it's post demo follow up, it's re engagement, uh, maybe we close lost and now we're going back after them. We have dedicated plays for all of those different parts of the funnel. And so now we're trying to put those in our application and others are, are trying to do the same thing to really help and assist the rep. And, and by the way, the rep wins in this, the rep just makes oh, more yeah. money and, and they sell more deals. And, you know, there's so many times in my life when I'm like, Oh, I should have sent that email. I should have followed up with that person. I oh, yeah, totally. And so it's, it is a bit of a safety net of, you know, 
oh, Pete got loaded into my like, let's talk again sequence. And Pete responded to me and it's, I love talking to Pete. So like, let's go have another conversation. I just think even with great intentions and great relationship, sometimes the humans fall flat and we just need to build that additional uh, layer in. Yeah, totally. And I, I think this is something that we think about quite a bit here at Atrium as it relates to managers, right? Because like the, the process, like what we want our managers to be doing is we want them spending time with their reps and improving their performance, right? Like having coaching conversations, making sure. And so like what that, we don't want them closing deals for their reps, right? We don't want them like, you know, taking over call, give me the wheel, right? <laughs> those, those sort of things. Um, what we want them to do is do only the things that that humans can do, which is, you know, um, ask discovery questions to your reps, like, hey, you know, I've noticed X, Y, Z, what's going on there, right? Um, and and provide guidance and and coaching. And so, you know, making sure that, that like reducing the amount of time that managers have to spend, you know, digging through charts and dashboards and whatever in order to like read the tea leaves to understand what's going on versus like, and this is a big thing that we've been doing with generative AI recently with our new sales coach functionality is just synthesizing across like what's going on with this rep. It's got a bunch of different metrics. Atrium is already doing a bunch of stats on it. Hey, what's going on? Here? Oh, a number one problem pipe hygiene problem right here based on this metric and this metric here are the three things that you should do about this you, know, you should block time on their calendar to make sure that they're actually have time on their their time available to like be managing their pipeline maybe pair, pair them with a colleague and then you know uh you know bump up your uh your pipe uh your pipe review cadence you know bucket number two here's the thing and and i think that like in this case, the managers that we work with, it's, it's not like, oh, here's this AI or there's this machine like telling me what to do and like, you know, forget you robot or whatever. It's like, hey, yeah, you know what? That is really nice. <laughs> now I can go talk with like, you know, Frank and our one on one and have like really thoughtful things to say versus just talking about deals like we like we normally would do. Um, I think that like, yeah, and I think that you guys have been doing some some interesting stuff around kind of like um generative ai stuff i know that like we're i um you know we use chorus over here at uh, at atrium my reps have been jumping up and down about the automated summarization stuff there are other stuff that you guys have been working on that you can talk about a little bit yeah the uh the chorus piece is pretty interesting with the meeting summaries and it's funny um we talked a little bit about the pmo org we're actually recording all of our internal program calls and it's summarizing with a transcript, sending next, uh, all the next steps and action items and shooting out kind of a whole summary. My PMO guys are loving it and use it for product feedback. So um, just selfishly too, I, I mean, I use uh, the tech side of GPT and otherwise all the time to, to create docs and stuff and kind of shortcut thought starters and whatnot. Um, but there's yeah. a lot. So, I, I mean, if we think about the theme of how do I support the rep such that they spend time on really value add things? I think if we can suggest the next best fit contact, draft a logical email that's well written and a thought starter, um, and you know it's it's really great. And you know I, I've looked at the coaching solutions that and the narratives you guys have with Sales Coach. It's it's amazing. We're doing some similar things. Uh, you know we talked about a little bit about that frontline management coaching and like, you know, yeah. jumping in and, and swarming a certain problem. We created this kind of a two dimensional matrix for all of our reps that compares the expected win rate and expected ASP of every deal. And we can actually oh. kind of put them as dots as where do they fall on the spectrum of the trade off of win rate and ASP, and then how much mm -hmm. are they selling in totality. And we plugged all that data through generative AI and it responds back with, something like, oh, hey, you know, it looks like Pete on average takes 20 days longer to sell a deal. He captures 25% more ASP. But if he was to maybe go faster and increase his win rate by concessing on price faster, his overall yield would be better. So give coaching right. to, to Pete okay. in this way. And so we're using generative AI to do those kinds of things internally um, wow. and then trying to integrate back in uh, kind of, you know, coaching and, and co-piloting inside of the platform to make sure that we can help aim reps in the right direction to accomplish the goal of selling faster and selling more effectively. I think, by the way, the prospect benefits from this because they're going to get more relevant reach out. They're going to get yeah. better messages, more relevant messages. 
um, you're going to get like, I get a lot of stuff that's still about discover org and do you want to sell your company? And, and I think the, be the better data, the better we get at um, training our tools to help avoid those situations. It's, it's better for all involved. Yeah. Well, and I think you guys happen to be in a pretty unique situation there in so far as, you know, you have a, a very muscular um, database, right. Of uh, human objects, account objects, intent information, all that sort of stuff, they can be used in order to generate, you know, appropriate, um, appropriate messaging and, and what have you. Um, I was, you know, uh, Gong is another one of our speakers here, at the virtual summit, and they're talking about it as relates to, you know, context in the deal, right? Um, because there's a lot of context in a given deal, which makes a lot of sense. Like this is what a CRM is supposed to do is like customer relationship. But of course it's like spread all over the place. So it's like having context of the deal is, is very powerful. Um, but you know, if you don't have that, it, like if all you have from a prospecting standpoint is, you know, first name, last name, title, et cetera, et cetera, on the, you know, on the contact object or on the lead object or whatever, pretty difficult to like generate something meaningful, <laughs> right? Versus like, you know, having the totality of all the fields, right? Like, I don't know how many fields there are on, on a Zoom info contact object, but it's it's gotta be like dozens and dozens and dozens. And of course, like it's, you know, connected, it's a child of the content of the account object, which probably also has, you know, dozens and dozens of fields. There's a lot of like really powerful things you can you can do that or you can do with that. And I imagine that you guys are, you know, well poised to, to leverage that. Is that something that you guys are working? I forget the name of the, um, the sales engagement solution that you guys have uh, in house there. Is that something that you engage, guys are yeah. engaged? Thank you. Yeah. Is that the, um, the, is that something that you guys are working on there? Yeah, I think um, uh, for all you Salesforce folks out there, we've, we've maxed out field counts on objects. So you, it, it shows you just how much we love data and, I won't, I won't say the number, but if you do some research, it's, it's in the hundreds of fields, but we're, we're running, yeah, we're running an immense amount of plays to trigger off. But the, the ideal is that you don't have to create all those fields. You don't have to, to do all that, um, that, you know, you, you leverage a combination of tools that just provides that insight in the background. And we're feeding into a lot of folks who, um, whether it's our technology or the back end of other applications, giving them the right data to, to make the assessment of who is the next best person what is the next best message that rich context of how many people do they have how you know what's the revenue um what are they spiking on and so i think to me it comes back to it, it's it's interesting and maybe puts me out on a limb but i think in you know in, in the older days you know sellers could be putting stuff directly into a financial system in an erp and so then came along like a better solution with crm of a more workflow centric tool that was around the sales motion. And I think what we're seeing is now this kind of next migration where CRM is becoming the repository of information, but not the best workflow tool to accomplish the task of sales. And so it's a whole nother breed now. And I think unless CRM potentially adapts more or changes, it's going to be relegated to the background of being more of a data repository and database. Yeah. yeah and I think, if, if you were to look five to 10 years in the future or less, um, reps potentially don't go into CRM at all and they live completely in a suite of tools just driving their opportunities forward. And to your point, you know, with the gong piece, all the context lives in that suite informed by some of yeah. this background data, but it facilitates a really incredible workflow that helps you understand where your opportunities are, uh, leverages all the data to tell you where to push and press um, where to send the next message, potentially sending it on your behalf. And that to me is when you reach great efficiency because it's going from, you know, back to manufacturing. I have hand tools, I can build anything, but they're kind of sloppy to, I have bespoke tools for the job. Why would I pick up no. a hammer? I have a very specific, I, I think, no. think about it this way. When you put a tire or a wheel onto a semi truck in a factory, older, old days, you had like a, you know, a pneumatic gun. Ratchets and yeah, whatever, you're going, yeah. Now they have this entire thing supported from the ceiling with all the lug nuts preloaded on it and all of them turn in like a half second. And that, that to me is the difference. It's like, you know, you go from having these tools that are kind of good for everything, but not the best for anything 
to now yeah. we have enough momentum, enough need, and enough capable people building these solutions to build really specific workflow uh, tools to drive sales in a, in a whole different way. For, for a use case that matters. I mean, like, yeah. it's funny, like you're, you're reminding me of like this, like our series A fundraise pitch, where it's just like, look, this is how like technology happen, like technology adoption and creation happens over time. There happens to be a use case that's like big enough to matter, right? Like our argument is like that sales management is important that it deserves its own it's its own auto lug nut <laughs> right like and and like you know there's there's various things like oh it turns out that like call recording was super like was enough like there were enough humans and there was enough value that was provided in recording and transcribing calls that then like yeah of course like people should buy this thing right um and of course like the that ebbs and flows with uh you know the the um interest rate environment and and what have you um but in general like if it's a use case that matters um with a large enough art like with an, a large enough uh tam of like humans who would end up like you know using it and it's going to drive relevant output then then like you know nature will find a way right entrepreneurs will will find a way and so like yeah if you think about crm it's like hosted database and then we have all these lovely like revenue operations people who are trying to like kludge it into the right direction to like make it like oh we can customize the the account like the, the page layout for the contact or the op for different roles it's like yeah that's a little bit of customization but like boy howdy that's like just kind of like putting a pad on the <laughs> on the uh on the ratchet right versus like actually the thing that this should look like for a rep is this the thing that this should look like for a manager is is this yeah i really like that i'm going to steal that uh that uh bespoke <laughs> tooling metaphor um well well scott um i think we're out of time right now thank you very much for for joining us folks um i hope you were super pumped to get to listen to the chief business officer at zoom info i'm sure probably you know 90 percent of you out there are zoom info customers and in some sort of capacity, I think we're a customer across a number of of, uh, of products over at Zoom Info. But um, I hope everyone hangs out for the next session. And uh, Scott, thank you very much for taking the time to hang out with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It was great. Okay, see ya. Thanks, Pete.